Hi, thanks for joining me for today's Bible reading for May 13th, and it is 2 Chronicles 9 through 12, verse 1. When the Queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon, she came to test Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem with a very great caravan, including camels that bore spices, gold in abundance, and precious stones. When she had come to Solomon, she talked with him about all that was in her heart. Now, you may remember this story from before because it is already mentioned in 1 Kings. So this is a retelling of this story. It'll be, I'm sure it's slightly different. I haven't ever compared them side by side. But anyway, um, so the Queen of Sheba came, it says, to, to test Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem with a very great caravan, including camels that bore spices, gold in abundance, and precious stones. When she had come to Solomon, she talked with him about all that was in her heart. Solomon answered all her questions. There, there wasn't anything hidden from Solomon which he didn't tell her. When the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his servants, the attendance of his ministers, their clothing, his cupbearers also, their clothing, and his ascent by which he went up to Yahweh's house, there was no more spirit in her. Now there's a footnote. So it says, or she was breathless. So it really took her. So the contrast, remember they didn't have internet. Let me just, let me just think out loud about this for a minute. They didn't have internet. They only had word of mouth, which was slow to get around, especially when you're farther away, obviously. And, but they did have people traveling the trade route. So I'm sure it was those that were, you know, the, the food distribution system people, the travelers, the caravan riders, the ship captains, etc. who passed on this type of information. So she had only heard so in, in each of the different countries, just like today, they all had their own culture and their own system set up, right? Their own different types of supplies that they had and used. So different resources, right? So you can, you can compare that to, for instance, um, I know a couple different circumstances about people in my circles throughout the years where they've come to America and been shocked, just major culture shock because of our supplies. Um, one was a, a young woman from Russia. Another one was a group of Chinese people. And um, they actually thought that the stores were staged for them, not realizing that that's how we normally live. They just couldn't believe it. It's a, it's a, um, what do they call it? Cognitive dissonance when you, like the reality is so different that you can't even really believe that it's real, right? So something of that happened with this queen and she's a queen, right? But you know, what What did she come from? Was she from a tribal type unit? Was she from a very developed area? You know, but it says that when she saw everything he had and the way that he could, you know, picture America and some, and even, you know, other parts of the West, maybe not now, but back, hundred years, you know, at the table settings and the amount of the the free um the amount of food in our spice cabinet, the amount of spices that we had access to, um just the the ease of acquiring dinnerware and cookware and linens for tablecloths and such as that, which are commonplace but have not always be for everyone, been for everyone everywhere, right? So when she came and she saw how his table was set and the organization, the level of development that he had, she was breathless. It shocked her. Verse five, she said to the king, it was a true report that I heard in my own land of your acts and of your wisdom. However, I didn't believe their words until I came and my eyes had seen it and beheld half of the greatness of your wisdom wasn't told me. I'm sorry, behold, half of the greatness of your wisdom wasn't told me. You exceed the fame that I heard. Happy are you men and happy are these servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. See, a wise and righteous leader, everybody's needs are met. Like a father of a household, you know, parents, um, a good homemaker, make sure everyone has their comfortable spots, you know, no matter how small or big the home, everyone has their area, you know, even the dog has has their little places of safety and their needs met, you know, the goats, the, the Bible says a righteous man cares for his beasts, 
right? So here Solomon was able to set things up so that everybody was satisfied in their role. You know, it doesn't have to be the king is satisfied and everyone else has drudgery, right? Everyone had their needs met. That's that's true with godly wisdom. So it says, happy are your men and happy are these servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be Yahweh your God who delighted in you to set you on his throne to be king for Yahweh your God because your God loved Israel. There it is again. Because your God loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore, he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. Now, imagine if God can do this in Solomon's day. He's made examples at other times throughout history. America was an example of this at one time um, when, you know, when she honored God more thoroughly, to, to put it the only way I know to say it. If God can do that and give snippets and tastes of what it's like when he comes in covenant with us. Imagine what eternity is going to be like with him when there is no more of this fall, of this destruction, no more remnants of the curse. Imagine how multiplied, the multiplied beauty and satisfaction and joy and worship and pleasure. It's going to be amazing. That's the essence of righteous leadership. Verse 9, she gave the king 120 talents of gold, spices in great abundance, and precious stones. There was never before such spice as the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. The servants of Hiram and the servants of Solomon, who brought gold from Ophir, also brought algum trees and precious stones. The king used algum, because what do you give to somebody who has everything, right? <laughs> what do you give to them? So somehow she was able, she was rich in spices and able to access and produce those. So maybe they added some flavor to Solomon's food that he didn't have. You know, you know, I'm, I love to cook, so I love having extra sauces and spices in my fridge to play around with. Um, let me just read and stop chatting so much now. <laughs> anyway, she says she brought the gold from over algum trees and precious stones. The king used algum tree wood to make terraces for Yahweh's house and for the king's house and harps and stringed instruments for the singers. There were none like these seen before in the land of Judah. King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatever she asked for, in addition to that which she had brought to the king. So she turned and went to her own land, she and her servants. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents. Hang on, let me look. Um, 20 metric tons. Wow. And uh, of gold. In addition to that which the traders and merchants brought, all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the country brought gold and silver to Solomon. King Solomon made 200 bucklers of beaten gold. 600 shekels of beaten gold went to one buckler. He made 300 shields of beaten gold. 300 shekels of gold went to one shield. The king put them in the house in the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with pure gold. There were six steps to the throne with a footstool of gold. They were fastened to the throne and armrests on either side. Why did I say that? Yeah, okay. Armrests on either side by the place of the seat and two lions standing beside the armrests. I skipped a line there. Um, Twelve lions stood there on one side and on the other side six steps. There was nothing like it made in any other kingdom. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all of the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Silver was not considered valuable in the day of Solomon. For the king had ships that went to Tarshish with Hiram's servants once every three years. I'm sure that's part of, I mentioned yesterday, um, Pastor Ron Phillips talks about this gold of Ophir and um, possibly coming from America. And here it says, as well as in other places in the Bible, it says it took three years. So that makes sense, right? If they went through the Mediterranean straight across, there is access to the Americas. Um, once every three years, the ships of Tarshish came, bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. All the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. They each brought tribute, vessels of silver, vessels of gold, clothing, armor, spices, horses, and mules every year. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots, 12,000 horsemen that he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. He ruled over all the kings from the river even to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. 
The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, and he made cedars to be as abundant as the sycamore trees that are in the lowland. They brought horses for Solomon out of Egypt and out, all, out of all the lands. Now the rest of the acts of Solomon, first and last, aren't they written in the history of Nathan the prophet, and the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite, and in the visions of Edo the seer concerning Jeroboam the son of Nebat? Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel 40 years. Solomon slept with his fathers, and he was buried in his father David's city, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his place. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. When Jeroboam the son of Nebat heard of it, for he was in Egypt where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon, Jeroboam returned out of Egypt. They sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Now this is a retelling of the story as well. Your father made our yoke grievous. Now, therefore, make the grievous service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, lighter, and we will serve you. He said to them, Come again to me after three days. So the people departed. King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, saying, What counsel do you give me about how to answer these people? All right, now let's stop for a second again. They are accusing Solomon of being too tough. A heavy yoke on their neck right but then we're going to come into when they asked the people who counseled when Rehoboam asked the old folks that counseled Solomon that's not the answer they gave and to me that's like proof that you know basically they're going to say we'll read it in a second but they're going to say if you serve the people they'll serve you that's a righteous leader right not you know press down on their necks and don't worry about what they say that's an unrighteous leader so I'm not necessarily buying what they said about Solomon because the other evidence, when you read around in context, that's not what it's showing, right? So I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud. Okay, so um, <clears throat> they went and asked, it says, Rehoboam took counsel with the old man who had stood before Solomon, his father, while he lived, saying, what counsel do you give me? How to answer these people? What people? Jeroboam from Nebat and Israel. They spoke to him, saying, if you're kind to these people, please them and speak good words to them. They will be your servants forever. But he abandoned the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. Boy, that doesn't sound like today's youth. Anyway, I mean, here in America, you know, the youth are totally rejecting the wisdom of the baby boomers who are getting to be the elders. There's not many of the other ones left, you know. They are becoming the seniors of this this era, and they're the ones that understand the freedoms that we've enjoyed and and why and how we've enjoyed them. And the young people are totally rejecting that that wisdom. Hopefully, not all of them, and hopefully, that's changing. But you know, wow. Anyway, it says um, he abandoned it and spoke to those young people, and he said to them, "What well, counsel do you give that we may answer these people who have spoken to me, saying, make the yoke that your father put on us lighter.'" The young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall tell the people who spoke to you, saying, Your father made your yoke heavy, but make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's waist, whereas my father burdened you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day and asked the king, saying, Come to me again the third day. The king answered them roughly, and the king Rehoboam abandoned the counsel of the old men and spoke to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to it. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So the king didn't listen to the people, for it was brought about by God that Yahweh might establish his word, which he spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. When, I, when all Israel saw that the king didn't listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion do we have in David? We don't have an inheritance in the son of Jesse. In other words, they're saying, Not my king. Um, Every man to your tents, Israel. Now see to your own house, David. So all Israel departed to their tents. But as for the children of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Hadoram, who was over the men, subject to forced labor, and the children of Israel stoned him to death with stones. So they're rioting and protesting now because of the unrighteous leadership. See how it works? It's a pattern. It never changes. King Rehoboam hurried to get himself to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against David's house to this day. 
When Rehoboam had come to Jerusalem, he assembled the house of Judah and Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against Israel to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam. So see, he's only got two of the 12 tribes with him now, Judah, where Jerusalem is, and Benjamin. But Yahweh's word came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin, saying, So you have to be careful when it switches around. See, because a minute ago, saying Israel rebelled, but now it's saying, Speak to Israel in Judah and Benjamin. So they're the Israel that didn't rebel, right? This is what I keep saying. Sometimes the Bible switches these words around, and you've got to be careful to understand who he's talking about. So of the 12 tribes of Israel, part of them rebelled, but these two are still under the leadership of Jeroboam. I mean, Rehoboam. Jeez. Okay. Um, and the way I might as well say it, the way I remember this is that J comes before R. Jeroboam comes before Rehoboam in the alphabet. So Jeroboam's the one that was in the north. You know, when they eventually split, Jeroboam's in the north with Israel and Rehoboam's in the south with Judah and Benjamin. And that's where Jerusalem is. So so that, that might help give you a visual picture for those of you that need that and don't know it yet. Verse 4. This is 11.4. Yahweh says, you shall not go up. Now remember, this is Shemaiah the prophet telling him. Yahweh says, you shall not go up nor fight against your brothers. Every man return to his house for this thing is of me. So that listen to Yahweh's words and return from going against Jeroboam. Rehoboam lived in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. He built Bethlehem, Etom, Tekoa, Bethzer, Soko, Adullam, Gath, Marish, Marishah, Ziph, Adoram, Lachish, Ezekah, Zorah, Aijalon, and Hebron, which are fortified cities in Judah and Benjamin. He fortified the strongholds and put captains in them and stores of food, oil, and wine. He put shields and spears in every city and made them exceedingly strong. Judah and Benjamin belonged to him. The priests and Levites who were in all Israel stood with him out of their territory. For the, the Levites left their pasture lands and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem for Jeroboam and his sons cast them off that they should not execute the priest's office to Yahweh. So this is a big church split, right? Verse 15, he himself appointed priests for the high places and for the male goats and the calves which he had made. After them, out of all the tribes of Israel, those who set their hearts to seek Yahweh, the God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice to Yahweh, the God of their fathers. So here's another thought that comes to mind. Solomon, David and Solomon just went through all this. All of David's work preparing the temple. Solomon spent, what, 20 years? Got everything in order. And they had their great joy that comes from putting things in God's order. And now it's all falling apart again. <laughs> all right, so it says, um, they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong for three years, for they walked three years in the ways of David and Solomon. Rehoboam took a wife for himself, Mahalath, the daughter of Jeremoth, the son of David, and of Abihel, the daughter of Eliab, the son of Jesse. He bore him sons, Jush, Shemariah, and Zaham. After her, he took Maka, the daughter of Absalom, and she bore him Abijah, Atai, and Ziza, and Shelemith. Rehoboam loved Makkah, the daughter of Absalom, above all his wives and his concubines, for he took 18 wives and 60 concubines and became the father of 28 sons and 60 daughters. Rehoboam appointed Abijah, the son of Makkah, to be chief, the prince among his brothers, for he intended to make him king. <clears throat> Excuse me. He dealt wisely and dispersed all of his sons throughout the lands of Judah and Benjamin to every fortified city and gave them food in abundance and sought many wives for them. Last chapter, 12. When the kingdom of Rehoboam was established and he was strong, he abandoned Yahweh's law and all Israel with him. Ugh. So here we go again. Verse 2. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had trespassed against Yahweh with 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen. The people were without number who came with him out of Egypt, the Lubim, the Sukkim, and the Ethiopians. He took the fortified cities which belonged to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Now Shemaiah the prophet came to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah who were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak and said to them, Yahweh says. So see, they gathered like, what are we going to do? Let's seek Yahweh and counsel together. And what happens? They also get a prophet there. So they're not just using their natural logic. They're not just following their own understanding. They're, you know, let's get the mind of God on this thing. So, uh, the prophet says, you have forsaken, Yahweh says, you have forsaken me, therefore I have also left you in the hand of Shishak. 
Then the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, Yahweh is righteous. When Yahweh saw that they humbled themselves, Yahweh's word came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves. I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverances, no, some deliverance, and my wrath will be poured out on Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they will be by his servants, and they will know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of Yahweh's house and the treasures of the king's house. He took it all away, but he also took away the shields of gold, which Solomon made. King Rehoboam made shields of bronze in their place and committed them to the hands of the captain of the guards who kept the door of the king's house. As often as the king entered into Yahweh's house, the guard came and bore them, then brought them back into the guard room. When he humbled himself, Yahweh's wrath turned from him so as to not destroy him altogether. Moreover, there were good things found in Judah. So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned for Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which Yahweh had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Nama the Ammonites. He did that which was evil because he didn't set his heart to seek Yahweh. Now the acts of Rehoboam, first and last, aren't they written in the histories of Shemaiah the prophet and Edo the seer in the genealogies? There were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried in David's city, and Abijah, his son, reigned in his place. That's it for today's reading. Thanks for joining me. See you tomorrow. Shalom.